here in our studio is Adam Andrzejewski of the organization OpenTheBooks.com. He is their founder and CEO here to talk about federal money that goes to Fortune 100 companies. Before we start, a little bit about your organization and its purpose. So the purpose of OpenTheBooks.com is to post every dime online in real time. So we have built the world's largest private database of public sector expenditures. We've captured uh, virtually all federal spending since the year 2000. In 49 out of 50 states, we've captured their checkbook spending oftentimes going back a decade, only California is the holdout on the state checkbook side. And in uh, 60,000 local units of government all across America, the municipal level units of government, we've captured 22 million public employees' salaries. So it's virtually every single public employee at every level of government, federal, state, and local, that we have in our database. Who supports you? Who, how are you financed? So we're funded by people. Uh, we do not take government money. Uh, we do over, not only do we open the books, Pedro, but we also uh, uh, audit those books. So if we took government money, that would be a conflict of interest. We are headquartered in Illinois. We, uh, we understand uh, conflicts of interest and pay to play, and we're not going there. The latest report that your organization looks at looks at money that goes to Fortune 100 companies. Before we dive into the specific, what was the goal? So the goal of this was to follow the money. I think, you know, all the way back to 1961, President Eisenhower warned of a military industrial complex. He warned that the solution to that in our free society was that the citizenry needed to be alert, they needed to be educated, and that was our goal uh, from the outset with this program was just to quantify very simply, the federal flow of funds into Fortune 100 companies, our most wealthy and well-connected uh, companies. And this is the second report in a series that we've done on this. Five years ago, we looked at the federal flow of funds from the year 2000 uh, through the year 2012, and we found $1.2 trillion over that 13-year period did flow to this for these Fortune 100 companies. And now we've, we've, uh, we've quantified the last four years. When it takes a look at the top line issue, $399 billion is that figure of federal funding going to those companies when it comes to those in the form of contracts, $393 billion, $3.2 billion coming from grants when it comes to the area of loan, direct payments and insurance, $2.7 billion, and then for lobbying expenses, $2 billion. Take those figures, break them down, why these organizations are getting this money. Well, they're, uh, they're getting the money because it's a favor factory at the federal level for the Fortune 100 companies. Um, our auditors, as you mentioned, found $2 billion dollars of Fortune 100 companies that they spent on lobbying Capitol Hill. Uh, and then they received, those companies received $3.2 billion worth of federal grants. Now, grants are subsidies. Those are giveaways. And Pedro, those grants are funded by you and I, the American taxpayer, to, again, our most elite corporations. Uh, and on top of all of that, our auditors found nearly $400 billion worth of federal contracts. So what, in a nutshell, what we found is that the more you pay, the easier it is to play. For every dollar these Fortune 100 companies uh, spent on lobbying, it returned $200 worth of federal contracts and grants. So you're drawing a direct comparison between the money that's used for lobbying directed to what they get back in funding for grants and, and contracts. But contracting is a way of life here in Washington, D.C. Why, why is this a surprise? So I don't, I don't think it's a surprise, but I think people uh, will be surprised at the sheer amount of, of grant making to the Fortune 100 companies. Here's the second thing. Um, I, the latest polling shows that 80% of the American people think that federal contracts and grants go to the most well-connected uh, corporation rather than the most qualified uh, corporation. And our data backs that up, that these are the companies, these Fortune 100 companies, have you know up, upwards of 100 lobbyists. Uh, and lobbying works. It brings home the bacon to the corporation. The top of that list when it comes to corporations that get those federal funds, Lockheed Martin with $137.9 billion. That's followed by Boeing, McKessing, General Dynamics, and Humana. Uh, amongst those top five, break down what the, the similarities are amongst them. So in the, in the top 10 uh, companies in the Fortune 100 receiving most of the money, uh, there are six defense contractors and there's four health, and, uh, health providers, health care providers. So uh, if you take a look at those top 10 companies, their return on investment was rather large. For every single dollar they spent on lobbying, they, it returned $1,000 worth of federal uh, contracts and grants. 
uh, and then this is the Boeing uh, company's case, at $181.4 billion between 2014 and 2017 in funding, lobbying that's done $72.5 billion in that time frame. What does Boeing do for the federal government with that money? So Boeing produces a lot of different things, um, and many of the things have, have a legitimate public purpose. Um, however, uh, you mentioned the $72 billion Boeing spent on lobbying. Now, the return in terms of grants was pretty extraordinary. Boeing, as a, as a company, received over this four-year period three-quarters of a billion dollars in terms of federal grants, these subsidies for Boeing products. Um, we've delved into Boeing. Uh, they also take a tremendous amount of taxpayer-backed financing through government banks like the Export-Import Bank. During an eight-year period that we studied, Boeing actually received $3 one dollar out of every three dollars of total lending by export import bank basically it was the bank of boeing what's the when it comes to these top companies what's the role that the department of defense play in these well the department of defense plays a large large role in this obviously six out of the top ten companies um, are defense contractors and for instance like lockheed martin 84 percent of their entire revenue or the corporation, and it's got a Wall Street market cap of $90 billion, 84% of what they sell on an annual basis comes from basically the, uh, the federal agencies, but specifically the Department of Defense. Our guest with us until 10 o'clock, if you want to learn more about these companies that receive federal funds and grants and their lobbying efforts as well, Adam Angievsky of OpenTheBooks.com for this conversation. You can call us at 202-748-8000 for Democrats, 202-748-8001 for Republicans and Independents, 202-748-8000 to make your comments and thoughts known as well at C-SPAN WJ. How did you get access to these records? So um, our honorary chairman is the former legendary United States Senator from Oklahoma, Dr. Tom Coburn. And back in 2006, Coburn on the right partnered with then Illinois Senator Barack Obama on the left, and they did the... Uh, they opened the federal checkbook to transparency for the first time ever. This was 2006. That's the data set that we used to compile this report. Uh, McKesson is listed. You listed one of those healthcare companies uh, involved. What do they do and what kind of money do they get from the federal government? So McKesson is a pharmaceutical company and a large portion of their contracts are derived from Veterans Affairs, providing uh, drugs and pharmaceuticals to Veterans Affairs. Uh, and McKesson... Uh, uh, because the healthcare companies did not spend as much on lobbying as the defense contractors spent. As a matter of fact, their, uh, their spending on lobbying is significantly less over this four-year period. $30.2 billion in funding from 2014 to 17 for McKesson. When it comes to lobbying, $6.1 million on 54 bills that took place from a period of 2014 to 2017 as well. We'll continue on and taking a look at more of this, but to your calls, we have some calls lined up for you. This is Mike in Houston, Texas, Republican line. Mike, you're on with our guest. Go ahead. Good morning. Great topic. Um, you know, you, I'm, I'm glad your guest spent some transparency. Would it not be a great world, a great scenario for us to have a transparent tax code? Wouldn't it be nice if the 74,000-page tax code was reduced to something where your next-door neighbors and you both understood it to be the same thing? Absolutely. We, we have CPAs all over the place who do taxes for average Americans, not just for the president, because the president doesn't know the tax code, who does? And the, the reason that we have so much money going on corporations is that the corporations know how involved government is in our daily lives. Government is involved in food production, health care, education. I mean, is there anything government doesn't have their fingers in? And so the any hand of government causes this to happen. Mike, thank you, for, thank you for the call. And to the caller's point, are, is, are these companies uniquely positioned to provide these services for the government and get that money in return? So it's a, it's a great call with a great perspective. And he talked to the complexity of the tax code, and I want to cover that. Um, right now, there is not a database at the federal level where if, if you're a corporation and if you get a tax credit, there is not a tax credit database. That needs to be created. That's the next step in the transparency revolution at the federal level. And I believe that legislation uh, is being drafted right now. Um, to, uh, to the caller's uh, further point about just the size of government, it used to be not that long ago, even into the early 2000s, where major corporations hired lobbyists to keep the government out of their business. Now what we find is that the hundreds of, and thousands of lobbyists are being hired by the most successful companies to actually bring government into their companies. 
to partner with government. They actually, uh, these corporations, feel uh, that government now is a giant customer of theirs, and uh, they cheerlead the effort on spending. Uh, from our Republican line, Ron is next. Ron, good morning. You're on with our guest. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Let's go to Ron in uh, Illinois, Republican line. Go ahead. Hello. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Um, sir, you have my blood boiling. Just to make sure I got this right, because I can hardly believe what I'm hearing. The government is uh, funding for-profit companies through grants and endowments and so forth. Is that correct? Yes, um, actually through grants, uh, direct payments. They're providing insurance subsidies as well. So taxpayer, lower cost financing backed by the American taxpayer. So in addition to companies that pay almost nothing, some that pay nothing, the government is in addition giving them billions of dollars on top of that. Am I correct so far? Yes. So you have, uh, you have companies like Google uh, who spend a tremendous amount of money on lobbying. I think Google spent somewhere around $50 million last year uh, lobbying the federal government. Uh, they received a $46 million uh, low interest loan through one of the uh, banks of the United States, the Overseas Investment uh, Bank, uh, to do an overseas project in Nigeria. That's just one example of how a large corporation has gamed the system where regular Americans are actually providing cheap financing to these very wealthy and well-connected companies. Uh, the top lobbying companies are listed in this report that you can find online, Dow DuPont at the top of that list, followed by Boeing, AT&T, Home Depot, Comcast, Lockheed Martin, General Electric, Alphabet, which our guest mentioned is Google, FedEx, and ExxonMobil. What would you like to add to as far as the lobbying amounts, the totals are concerned? So we took a look at the lobbying broken down by industry. So the defense contractors, obviously, they spent the most, about $300 million over this four-year period. Uh, we took a look at the tech companies, the five largest tech com companies of Amazon and Apple and Facebook and Google and Microsoft, and they spent about $200 million on lobbying over this period. Now, we didn't find federal contracts and grants flow to those companies, but what we did find is that they were interested in a number of different issues key to their businesses. Uh, for instance, uh, on privacy issues, and Apple was very interested in tax issues. They had a lot of money overseas that they wanted to bring back to the country, and they wanted a lower uh, tax rate to be able to do that. And they spent about uh, $38 million lobbying the federal government for that tax rate when they repatriated the money. Uh, data security breaches was another big issue of the tech companies. Uh, from Democrats Line, Jim in Oregon. Hello. Hello. Uh, my question for uh, Adam is... Uh, how is it they uh, apply or get the grants? Uh, I don't uh, understand that part of it. If you could go into a little detail on that, I'd appreciate it. And I appreciate this program that he's uh, presenting for you. Thank you. So across the entire federal continuum at OpenTheBooks.com, we have given oversight to federal grant making, and it's a tremendous amount of money. In rough numbers, the federal government doles out as many grants as the entire military defense budget spend. It's very, very close, almost a one-to-one -one basis. So there's nearly a grant for everybody. For example, like Cornell University, they took a million dollars for a study on where it hurts the most to be stung by a bee. NASA doled out a million dollars to prepare the nation's religions for the discovery of extraterrestrial life. Health and Human Services spent a million dollars, one point four million dollars, uh, on a sex education program for California prostitutes. Uh, specific to Fortune one hundred companies, uh, at three point two billion dollars worth of federal grant making over the four year period. As we talked about, Boeing was the leader. They got three quarters of a billion dollars worth of grants out of federal agencies. And again, those are subsidies. Uh, the process is supposed to be you apply for a grant. And obviously, the big corporations, they have the human resources and, and the uh, ability to navigate federal grant making and take a tremendous amount of dollars. Uh, from the fact sheet from 2014 to 2017, you heard our guest mention some of this $399 billion for those uh, funding just in t total. From those grants, $3.2 billion 
contracts making up the bulk of that at $393 billion. Where can people go online to read this? So we have our report online at our website at openthebooks.com, and it's right on the home pages. It's the first report up on the right side in the middle under the report section. Republican line from West Virginia. Richard, hello. Hey, good morning. Uh, uh, some of the things you said made my question not terribly relevant, but I think probably the bottom line on all this is that the uh, government is too big, too powerful, and uh, uh, some people have to try to get it swung in their way. Uh, my question was, um, if you, I run a company, I'm the sales salesman out to prospective customers to try and convince them of the value of what I've got to sell. And when you mentioned Boeing, I thought, well, uh, they need to, to sell their product, and the government is their cu customer. So maybe not all of this and some of the other things you mentioned are as nefarious as they might seem on first glance. I guess it's kind of a question, isn't it? Well, I, I think that's, uh, that's, again, a great perspective because not all of this is waste. You know, there's a lot of these uh, defense contracts. We get a ship. We get a nuclear warhead. That certainly has a public purpose and a tangible result at the end of the day. And so, uh, you know, on the center right, they can take solace in the fact that about 98% of the federal uh, spend into the Fortune 100 goes on contracts. The center right perspective on that would be you want our best and brightest companies working on our most significant problems in the nation, and you don't want to grow the federal bureaucracy. So, um, so the center right can take solace in that. I think what on a bipartisan basis, what gets people most upset is this federal grant making. Because again, those are subsidies. We're paying for it. And if it was really a good idea to be funded by taxpayers, these Fortune 100 companies, they have the network. Their stocks are traded on Wall Street. They have the most innovative suite of financial products in world history. They can get these good ideas funded on their own and lighten the load on the American taxpayer. What's the ability of smaller companies to get access to this kind of money? Well, and that, that begs the question, you know, from our report, this is one of the questions that we bring up. And certainly, as we know, bigger is not always better. And when you have such, you know, a default position of the federal uh, administrative state and of Congress to funding large corporations, you're fencing out a lot of good ideas. Uh, Ohio is next. We'll hear from Rob, uh, who joins us on our Republican line. You're, go ahead. You're on. Go ahead. I'm sorry. This is Ron. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, I have a question. It's like, why do they take all this money and they give it away to stupid, you know, like, who who cares about where a bee stings you? It's going to hurt. <laughs> the point is, it's like, why don't they say, you know what, we need someone to oversight and watch where all this money's going. And, you know, the money we could actually save instead of wasting a million dollars to find out where a bee gets stung, put that money back into our debt, our U.S. debt of $22 billion. Exactly. Um, so the caller brings up an important point that, uh, look, there's, there is, across the entire continuum, a target-rich environment of wasteful government spending. And he's exactly right. Congress, the solutions are, we think it's a three-part solution. Congress needs to crack down. They need to get back to doing their job and doing oversight. It's a little bit more work than what they're used to doing, but this is vitally important. The second thing is the administrative state, the federal bureaucracy, they need to start auditing these grants, these contracts, and holding these, com these companies accountable to metrics and performance. Uh, and they can start with forensic audits. Follow the money. It's evidentiary and make sure these companies are actually providing value for what the hardworking American taxpayer is providing in terms of the money. The third thing that we've advocated is that the president, as commander in chief, should declare war on waste. And we've outlined a three pronged strategy for President Trump to declare war on waste. And prong number one is to put every dime online in as real time as possible. In terms of creating these reports, oftentimes we have to wait six months for all the spending to come in. And it's statutory that it should go online in vir virtually in real time. The second prong is to cut 5% of the waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse. And we think that the president, uh, that welfare reform should start with the uh, Fortune 100 companies. Uh, where is the Republican on Capitol Hill uh, uh, armed with the legislation to kick Daddy Warbucks off the dole? 
uh, the third prong of this, of the war on waste for the president, should be he should report to the American people on a timely basis and engage the bureaucracy, reward those federal bureaucrats who actually cut their budgets. Uh, taking a look at Boeing's case in your report when it comes to grants, the top number of grants coming during that time period from the Department of Defense. Talk about this undisclosed, though, because I see that several times in this report. What does that mean? So undisclosed happens uh, too frequently throughout our report. Oftentimes, the federal disclosure of the data, it's government, they make mistakes, uh, they don't fill in all the fields, and far too often, the funding department has not been uh, filled in on the grant transactions. Uh, from our independent line, next up is Margaret. Uh, I'm sorry, Margaret from our West Virginia Democrats line. Hello. Good morning. I'm wondering if you have talked to other companies that are also digging into um, where our tax money goes. There's a site, uh, and I've just lost the name of it right now, but there's a site that uh, it goes back to the before the 2000s, and they put up how much we have given corporations, even outside of our country. We give Deutsche Bank millions of dollars. Uh, I, I think that our, our country, we could pay our debt off, as that gentleman said, if we can't quit giving these tax breaks to these corporations. And But the problem is, as you well know, that these corporations buy off the, through their lobbying efforts, they buy off our members of Congress. Um, coal companies get get subsidies, it, it, you name it. It's banks, it's Wall Street. It, it's just ridiculous what we give of our tax money. And I've been calling C-SPAN about this for years now and asking people if they know um, how much we are giving away. So I appreciate that you're doing this. And, and I would suggest, though, that you go online and just see if you can find another organization that um, I'm just so upset with myself that I can't think of a name of that organization. But it's been working since the early 1900s. I'm sorry, 1990s. Okay, um, that's Marjorie. And hopefully that's Marjorie in West Virginia. Well, it is a favor factory. We found that the, the more you pay, the easier it is to play. So on the $2 billion worth of um, lobbying dollars that the Fortune 100 spent lobbying Capitol Hill, if you break that down per member of Congress, it amounts to $3.7 million over this four-year period per member of Congress. So if you're out there, and if you worked hard and got a member of Congress elected, and then you're you wonder why they go south on their campaign promises and their core issues so quickly once they get to Capitol Hill. Just the Fortune 100 companies threw $3.7 million on average in lobbying against every single member of Congress. That is influence. That is persuasion. It affects policy. And the Fortune 100 companies know that it works. On the list also, at and on that list, FedEx, Ford Motor Company, why are they there? So Ford, I mean, all these companies have significant stake in complicated federal issues uh, on regulation, uh, on contracts and grants, uh, and so they feel that they need a seat at the table on public policy. And, and so Ford Motor Company, they're hiring lobbyists. I think the Ford Motor Company had on average about 20 lobbyists uh, on their payroll over the course of this four-year period. Um, companies like Lockheed Martin had, uh, had over 100 lobbyists on their payroll. Uh, Boeing had about 112, on average, lobbyists on their payroll. Um, we, there's 10 case examples in our report. If you add up the number of lobbyists just for these 10 companies, and they want the 10 companies that spent the most on lobbying. These are the case examples in our report. There was nearly 650 lobbyists uh, employed uh, over this uh, every single year by just these 10 companies that we profiled. And you highlight also Caterpillar, the maker of tractors, combines, and steamrollers. Right. I mean, all these issues have all these companies have domestic issues. They have international issues, and they feel that by um, spending significantly and heavily on lobbying, they're getting a return on investment. Just overall, as we discussed earlier on the program, for every dollar that was spent on lobbying, the Fortune 100 companies in the aggregate received two hundred dollars worth of federal contracts and grants. Um, on the two billion dollars that they spent collectively on lobbying. The return on investment just on grants was 60% because they got $3.2 billion in federal grant making. And then 
that doesn't even consider the nearly $400 billion of federal contracts. Because you made it a point overall when it comes to the philosophy of lobbying. Is lobbying a bad thing? No, I mean, uh, corporations have uh, First Amendment rights. They've got significant interests in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And so, uh, I, so they certainly need um, to get their point of view into the public discussion. Uh, I think there is a tipping point uh, at a certain point of what lobbying tries to accomplish. And I think that, that tipping point is where the American ed uh, people need to be, um, you know, we all need to know what's going on so we can hold not only the politicians accountable, for tax and spend decisions, but also the corporations accountable for their activities. What is that tipping point then in your mind? What crosses that line? So I think it crosses the line when um, corporations view the government as that giant customer, and then there can never be any spending cuts to the bureaucracy. When they completely cheerlead and put the largesse of the corporate treasury behind a larger and bigger government that we the people have to pay for, I think that's that is. The, uh, that's the tipping point. Uh, this is our next call from California, Independent Line, Aggie. Good morning, you're on with our guest. Good morning, and thank you for taking my call. Earlier in the conversation, Pedro made a comment in response to the guest speaker. He said that uh, lobbying for contracts is done in D.C. all the time. Well, just because it's done all the time doesn't make it right. If somebody's walking off a bridge into the ocean, are you going to walk off after them? There should be no federal grant to Fortune 100 companies, and this is why we need term limits for our congressmen. And well, that's, that's just my opinion. Well, I agree. So I was hard on Republicans earlier, and now I'm going to be hard on Democrats. Look, um, in the run-up to the 2018 elections, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, her language on ethics reform said that Democrats need to break the strong bond between corporate lobbyists and the federal uh, checkbook. Now they have control in the House. I haven't seen gainful uh, and real uh, measures put forward to execute on that campaign promise. Obviously, the president in 2016, he ran on the promise of draining the swamp. And he, had, he campaigned on ethics legislation very similar to the rhetoric Nancy Pelosi was using in the run-up to the midterms in 2018. So maybe, maybe the two political parties, if they are serious, maybe they can get together on some ethics reforms. Just speak Virginia Democrats live. Elliot, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I used, I'm a retired federal worker. I used to work in contracts in the government, and I used to see thousands and thousands of dollars being ripped off by the taxpayer. Uh, I tried to uh, report these uh, corrupt behaviors, and all they did to me was uh, threaten me and mistreat me. I went to NCIS, the Navy, you know, criminal investigation. I went to uh, IG, the Naval IG. I went to Office Special Counsel, and and uh, they just ignored me. They uh, basically, you know, threatened me, as you can say, to shut up and quit talking. And uh, I'm retired military as well as almost 40 years uh, in the federal government. So I'm very, very aware of, you know, the money that goes out. And I watch all these thousands and thousands of dollars, these contracts we get these kickbacks. I mean, these uh, contracts are getting all this large amount of money. And the federal workers from the, from the commander, Captain Admiral, all the way down to the uh, civilians, were getting kickbacks. And I could see the money going out. I could see the corruption. I read the contract. They were not doing what they're supposed to do in the contract. And every time I would speak up, they pretty much threatened me, you know. So, uh, okay, in that, a way, I'm that, retired now. Uh, that's Elliot's uh, perspective. Well, and I'm, I'm troubled by the experience. And you hear that from whistleblowers, the retaliation. Um, in 2016, uh, President Donald Trump ran on the system is rigged. From the left, Bernie Sanders also ran on the system is rigged. Um, and so what we, what we find at the federal level is that the system is functioning more like a legalized money laundering scheme. Uh, with money laundering, traditionally, things are hidden. It's all in darkness. I think the importance of our report is we have dragged this scheme into the sunshine. Now, make no mistake, Pedro, it's all legal. And probably that's the scandal. It's not right. It's not ethical. 
is there a whistleblower provision like the one the gentleman described on the phone? Is there some avenue they can report these things? There are avenues, and through uh, each agency has an inspector general. There is a Whistleblowers Protection Act, so whistleblowers are supposed to have some rights. A uh, viewer off of Twitter, this is Adele saying and asking you what the average person could do to stop the onslaught of lobbying and cheating out of our tax dollars. That's what she says anyway. Go ahead. So I think we need to raise our voices. Um, and it doesn't only, you know, this, this scheme uh, doesn't only include lobbying dollars for federal contracts and grants or lobbying dollars to influence regulations. It also includes these Fortune 100 companies are providing political cash to powerful congressmen. Like, for instance, in the state of Connecticut, uh, John Larson is an 11-time elected congressman, and he, hit, he sits on House Ways and Means. And we took a look at his campaign disclosures, and in his district is based a defense contractor, United Technologies. They're, last year, they received $11 billion in federal contracts and grants. Uh, United Technologies... Uh, is the number one campaign contributor to John Larson in his district. They've provided through their employees, their company political action committee, and even their lobbyists giving uh, Larson campaign cash about $360,000 over the course of his congressional career. Independent line from Sue in Maryland. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my call, and thank you for doing this work on um Transparency, it's really important. Um, I wanted to um, make a point about regulatory capture. Um, I've recently been reading a book called The Danger Within Us and, um, by Jean Lenzer, and she talks about um, the regulatory capture of the FDA and how um, there was actually a group of scientists, the FDA 9, who tried to come forward and speak against some of um, not just that uh, ethical um, situation, but really what what turns out to um, what results in also bad science because um, the corporations and the for-profit industries are making the decisions around what kinds of studies are done. Um, and I think part of the problem is that there's been a long campaign to convince Americans that regulations mean um, that, they're, that, that they're bad for business when, in fact, regulations protect us from bad business practices. They protect us. They protect our health. They have set a standard that's made America um, just a world standard that's made us a country that, you know, other countries look to um, in terms of things like safe food, safe drugs, and um, hopefully safe and safe environments, safe um, labor practices. Um, so when people talk about regulatory agencies, I think they forget that a lot of these agencies are doing a very important job that's that's separate from what Congress does, and they've been highly politicized, and I'm not sure what the solution is, but it seems like that some of these um, positions shouldn't be political, politically appointed positions. They, they need to be something where the, the mission statement of what the regulatory agency does is is transparent and doesn't change and isn't um, susceptible to things like um, Citizens United giving corporations speech that's okay. that's not, you Sue, know. Sue, thank you. Got, got your point. We'll let our guests respond. So I, I think, obviously, we need a balance between regulations and the free market. And I think the determination of that balance gets worked out in the marketplace of, uh, of public opinion. And that's where you have the corporate lobbying dollars, like in the five tech firms of Apple, you know, the five significant tech firms of Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. They spent nearly $200 million to influence that policy. The only way to counteract that amount of money, that amount of influence up on Capitol Hill is for we, the people, to raise our voices and weigh in on these issues with our members of Congress. Uh, lobbying is so pervasive in the Fortune 100 that only eight companies out of the Fortune 100 didn't spend any lobbying disclosed dollars. 92% of the Fortune 100 spent money lobbying. Andrew Angievsky, uh, I'm sorry, Adam Angievsky of OpenTheBooks.com. He's their founder and CEO. And if you want to read more of this report, OpenTheBooks.com is the website you can find that and read some of the findings for yourself. It's online. There's the cover to it. Uh, Roger is next from Illinois. Uh, Republican line, hi. Yes, good morning to you. The question I have is, other than direct con uh, campaign contributions, what are some of the other things spent on, the money spent on? So, uh, 
uh, Roger, would you clarify that a bit, please? Well, the one gentleman called and said uh, one of the politicians received campaign contributions. How else do they spend all these millions of dollars? So uh, corporations, uh, you know, when they employ these armies of lobbyists, those armies make big money. So when you're employing 100 lobbyists, oftentimes, on average, during the, during the year, uh, they're chewing up a lot of money. And then, you know, there are, there are ethics statutes on Capitol Hill where the corporations, you know, they have to spend within parameters. They can't spend outside of those parameters to influence policy. Um, so, you know, there's, there's different gift limits and bans and things like that. Um, earlier I referenced... Uh, Congressman John Larson in Connecticut, who sits on the powerful Appropriations Committee at House Ways and Means, where his number one contributor is that United Technologies, a defense contractor who gets a lot of grants and a lot of federal contracts. Uh, the Republicans have these issues, too. For instance, up in Minnesota, uh, Eric Paulson, he was a congressman uh, through the last election. He did get voted out, but Cargill is in his district. And Cargill, even the CEO of Cargill, gave uh, Paulson... Uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars worth of campaign cash, and Paulson received tens of thousands of dollars worth of uh, campaign cash from Cargill. And Paulson also sat on the powerful Appropriations Committee at House Ways and Means. As far as the staffing of these lobbyists, how large are these staffs that go on Capitol Hill for, especially amongst these four hundred or these Fortune one hundred companies? So, in our in our ten case examples in our studies in the report, we we took a look at how many lobbyists those ten companies employed, and I added up those numbers this morning. And it was six hundred and fifty lobbyists just on these ten companies. Um, the app, you know, there are uh, many companies employing over a hundred lobbyists in a given year, and if you think about that, if you employed a hundred people in your in a in a private company. That's a significant company. I started a company with my brother, a publishing company. We employed 150 people, and it was a 20 million dollar gross revenue business. So these these lobbying staffs are large. They're powerful. They influence policy, and uh, they exert a tremendous amount of influence. And they spend those dollars because it does work. New Mexico is next. Democrats lying. David, hello. Yes. Good morning. Uh, Adam, I appreciate it, and I admire you for doing this. Uh, what we all have to understand is when you say government, we're talking about Democrats, Republicans, men, women. They're all in this here together, and I Absolutely. wish they were out looking for us Americans. They're not, though. You know, I hate to say it. I'm 72 years old, and my respect and, and, and confidence in our government is down to zero. They do not care for us. Otherwise, they would have taken care of this long ago. They can't point the finger at one person and say it's his fault, her fault. They're all equal, and uh, it's just a sad thing. I feel bad for America. Uh, we're just not counted in their in their thoughts or their their wishes for us. I, I appreciate you letting me uh, call in and say, but um, just good luck to us. I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And this, this is an issue that crosses all party lines, whether you're uh, on the right, the left, or in the middle. Uh, corruption uh, is a transpartisan issue. The latest polling by Rasmussen shows that nine out of every 10 people feel that federal government corruption is a significant issue. 53% say that it is a crisis. And it, corruption is the issue that leads all other issues in terms of crisis. For example, climate change in the poll was only at 39%, with corruption at 53%. So this is the old story, where good policy, some ethics reform at the federal level, would also be good politics. Uh, Richard is from Missouri, Independent Line. Yes, uh, the Kerma column of waterways was the biggest boondoggle many years ago. How does it stand now? What is the biggest boondoggle now? So we took a look at the billion-dollar boondoggles coming out of the Fortune 100 companies. Thank you very much for your question. And I have to say it's probably uh, the project contracted by Boeing. So Boeing is in charge of about 1,200 contractors. It's a massive project. It was budgeted to be $6 billion. 
on the space launch system. This is the rocket launch system that's supposed to put our astronauts back on the moon and eventually maybe even to Mars. Uh, the project is uh, late. It's years late and it's way over budget, about $3 billion. But yet NASA just greenlit about $350 million worth of performance bonuses to Boeing employees and their contractors. And, you know, that begs the question in this report, Pedro, uh, because Boeing spent $72 million over the course of the past four years on lobbying Capitol Hill, did that influence the payment of these performance bonuses on a project that is way late and way over budget? For the companies that you list in this report, do you ask them directly what they think of the findings and do you get responses from them? Well, uh, this story today uh, in the print newspaper broke in the Washington Times and the reporter reached out to all 10 case studies in our report and none, none of the companies would respond on the record. Uh, this is the headline, by the way, from Washington Times. James Varney wrote the story, Taxpayers Fund Research for Rich, Powerful Companies, highlights the work of Open the Books and some of the responses there. You can read that on the Washington Times website. Richard is next in Minneapolis, Republican Live. Uh, yes, good morning. I think uh, lobbying is good. Uh, every other big industrialized country is subsidizing our industry. Look at Airbus. Look at all the farmers in uh, Japan. Look at all the farmers in Europe. They're all subsidized. So what's wrong with subsidized? we got to do that to keep up. They're eating our lunch. <laughs> well, I think that's Chinese capitalism, right? That's how Chinese uh, capitalism is practiced, where uh, you curry favor with the government uh, for your business. America was, I think, fundamentally founded on a different concept, and that's individual freedom and liberty. And so, uh, so I, I disagree with the frame. Uh, from Georgia, in Pooler, Georgia, Brad, Democrats line. Uh, good morning, Pedro. Good morning, Adam. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I, I don't disagree with anything that you said, Adam, uh, but it's a little one-sided. My question is about the, uh, the density of the federal acquisition regulation, uh, and that doesn't specifically speak to grants, but, you know, uh, there's not only the federal acquisition regulations, there's the defense federal acquisition regulations, there's a defense acquisition university. And so the complexity and, you know, is, is the problem with what, what is happening or is the problem with the system that we've established that allows it to happen, which I think also speaks to some of the lobbying questions that some other callers have had. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get off the line and, and take my answer on the TV. Thank you. So I, I think the system has been designed this way or has evolved this way, and, and we, we put the onus on that on Congress. Congress can bring the reforms. They can write the rules. For example, uh, I think that federal procurement should start to use the latest in technology to harness harness the online reverse auctions, the Dutch auctions, which amongst qualified bidders would bid down the price of goods and services. Where this has been tried in local governments, in state governments, it's not being tried at the federal level. It has saved taxpayers up to 40% of those contracts. It's not going to work for every single contract. For instance, we have a lot of contracts here on research and development. Um, and it's not going to, and those are long-term contracts, and you can't use a Dutch auction on a research and development contract. Uh, there are uh, also service contracts where corporations bid zero just to get the business because then they make their money on the service aspect of that contract. These things are complicated, but Congress certainly needs to give oversight to every facet of the contract and certainly the grant procurement process. Adam Andrzejewski is with OpenTheBooks.com. That's the website if you want to read more of these findings online for what they've looked at concerning Fortune 100 companies. We thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Pedro, for your interest in our work.